This video discusses analog sensors. Sensors have six functions. Their primary use is to protect humans, to protect the robot, collect data, monitor systems for malfunctions, provide measurement, and to monitor parts for identification. We can group uh, sensors in several different ways. One way that we would uh, group sensors would be for contact or non-contact. Okay. Sensors can have uh, two types of signals. They could either have a discrete signal or an analog signal. And in, again, in this set of slides, we're going to focus on the analog. Okay, so a discrete signal is a signal that just basically has two values. So a lot of times we refer to that as a binary. It can be either on or off. Now technically inside of the robot this would uh, mean uh, a on or a one would be a high voltage and a zero would represent or, or would actually be inside of the robot controller would be like a low voltage almost zero, but it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly zero, but very small. All right, so let's talk then about a transducer. Now, a transducer is a fancy word for saying analog sensor, all right? And the definition of a transducer is it's an electronic device that converts a physical quantity into an electrical signal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure something whether it's a pressure, temperature, distance, we're going to try to measure something. I'm sure you've measured lots of things in your time. And so what here we're going to do is we're going to measure it, uh, but that measurement value is going to be turned into an electrical signal then that we can feed into the robot controller or PLC. So... Um, <clears throat> We're just going to kind of go through here and uh, look at some of these I've got listed here, thermocouples and stuff, and we'll talk about some of them in detail. Okay, so uh, input transducers, or as I said, technically these are analog sensors for the most part, are classified as either active or passive. So an active sensor or active transducer means that it's going to need some sort of external power to make the thing actually activate and work. A passive type device is just a um, means that it's, it's going to work whether it, it's actually connected up or not. So it doesn't need any external power for it to work. All right, so let's just take a look at some of the uh, different uh, transducers or analog sensors and what they can measure. So the first one here is a tachometer. A tachometer measures revolutions. Okay, so usually we're going to measure in rev revolutions per minute, but we're measuring the speed of revolutions, how fast something is turning around, spinning around. Another thing that we can... Um, measure would be light intensity. Okay, so a photocell will measure the intensity of the light. Okay, so you can see here this is just a, a very simple resistive um, photocell. Um, this one here is actually a passive cell um, or pa passive uh, device where its resistance will change as light falls on the uh, sensor piece. Basically, this is a resistive, resistive material in here, but as the light intensity hits it, it will either increase or decrease that um, resistance, depending on the light intensity. And so that will, uh, that then we can measure by basically putting a, a voltage across there and measuring the current or uh, so as the light intensity changes then we can detect how much how much uh, intensity of light there is 
All right, a piezo meter sensor can be used to measure a static liquid. And basically what this is, is this is a crystal. And what happens is as it gets pressure on it, it actually puts out a voltage. Now the voltage is actually very small. It's kind of in millivolts, all right? But it's actually gonna output this voltage regardless of power. So technically this is again a um, passive sort of device where it's just gonna output a voltage reading, uh, but a very, very small voltage reading that um, based on the pressure. Accelerometers can measure acceleration forces. Uh, now, accelerometers are active devices. They need power to get them to work. Okay, so, um, but uh, they measure how fast something, how fast the speed is changing. So acceleration is the change in speed. So we're measuring how fast the speed of a device is changing. Yeah whether it's increasing in speed or deceleration, decreasing in speed. Uh, current transducers can measure current. Now this is a clip-on sort of current meter. And as you can see, it, it, this one's actually rated for 75 amps. So what that means is that this can read very, very large currents. So like, uh, if you take like a DC circuits class, we'll be measuring current using ammeters. And we have to actually break the circuit and then insert the ammeter to measure the current. But for very large currents, number one, that's uh, very impractical uh, to disconnect very large cables. Number two is most meters could not read that but this type of transducer is an active transducer that you can just clip on there and it reads the magnetic field generated as the current flows through so it's it's excellent for very large currents uh, if you were talking just in uh, very small milliamps the transducers like this don't work very well speakers are a, an example of a transducer and um, a speaker technically it's kind of a, it, it actually takes the electrical signal and turns it into an audio signal into pressure waves in the air but microphones are the exact opposite of speakers so a microphone and a speaker basically do there, you know, you could actually use a speaker as a microphone or a microphone as a speaker, although they don't work very efficiently because they're designed for it to work in the opposite way. But what a mic microphone does is take pressure waves and changes those into an electrical signal. Speakers then reverse that. They take that electrical signal and turn it back into pressure waves. Antenna used for sending radio or TV transmissions. These uh, convert the uh, electrical signal into an electromagnetic signal, sort of like light that's actually transmits through the air and then receives that signal um, through the air and converts it back into an electrical signal. Thermocouples are used to measure temperature, okay? And so thermocouples are transducers that measure temperature. And the way these are made, they're made from two dissimilar type of materials, okay? So um, two dissimilar materials bonded or soldered together at one point, okay? So that's how we make a thermocouple. All right, here's just some various pictures of some thermocouples that uh, are designed for industrial type use so that we can, uh, you know, typically I'll have like a stainless steel co cover over top of it to protect it from corrosion. All right, now technically thermocouples are passive devices. They're kind of like the piezometers that measure pressure, 
um, they output a very small voltage regardless of whether you have anything connected to it or not. Now, obviously, you know, with a passive device, you know, it's all fine and dandy that it can measure something, but if you can't hook, you know, if you don't hook it up to a, a controller of some sort, then you can't really determine what it's reading, but it does not need external power to make it actually work. All right. So the way a thermocouple works is that when you heat up one end of a piece of metal, it will uh, separate the charge. Now, depending on the type of metal, it may chase the electrons away from the heat or it may attract the electrons. Okay. So here's an example where we heat up one end of this and it chases away the electrons down to the cooler end. And now we have a potential difference. So we have a voltage and we can measure that voltage. So um, other types of metals, on the other hand, uh, when you heat them up, they attract the electrons. So here's a, an example of a thermocouple then. And we have iron on the left, which as we heat up the tip, it's attracting the electrons. And then we have constantan on the right, and we heat it up, it chases those electrons away. So when we join the iron and the constantan at the tip, we join them at, that's, that's basically the tip of our thermocouple. And what happens is we attract the electrons from in the iron up to the heat, and we chase away the electrons in the constantan, and that basically gives us, uh, maybe, you know, technically probably not double, but just, you know, kind of double the voltage. So it makes the voltage much easier to read now because it makes it a higher voltage. Again, when I say higher, it's still an extremely small voltage in the millivolt or microvolt range. All right, so here's a chart showing the voltage now notice this voltage is in microvolts. So up here at the top, up here at the top of this right here, it's 70,000, but that's 70,000 microvolts, which means it's only 70 millivolts. And as you look at these traces, they're not, you know, most of them aren't even getting anywhere near that. Most of them are only getting maybe 10 millivolts. Now what this chart is showing you is the different types of thermocouples. So you can see there's a T-types, S-type, R-type, N-type, K-type, J-type, E-type, B-type. So these are all different thermocouples. And what that means is that they're made with different types of metal. Okay. So we have the constantan and iron. Okay. So that makes one type of thermocouple. This actually makes the J-type thermocouple, which is the most common. Okay. So if we go to the next slide here, so we have the J-type thermocouple. It's made of iron and constantan. And uh, usually when they build these, they have uh, the red wire and the white wire, where the red wire is going to be the low potential and the white would be the high potential. And so again, you know, when you heat up this tip, so when you heat up this tip over here, it's going to generate a voltage then along these wires. So at, at the these two tips of the wires, then we can connect a meter and measure that voltage. Now the J-type thermocouple is the most common, and it's made of iron and constantan uh, with a red and white label, a uh, red and white uh, sorry uh, wires attached to it. Those, that's the most important thing that I think you need to remember for the exam here. J-type is most common. It's made of iron and constantan, uh, and it uses red and white color codes. And the red is the low potential, and the white is the high. Okay, It has a very large range. The range is uh, minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit to, to over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so it has an extremely large range.
And you don't have to mem memorize the numbers here, but uh, you should know that the J-type is the most common made of iron and constantan and uh, uses red and white wires. That, those are kind of the key aspects that I want you to know about thermocouples. All right, so over here we'll talk about, uh, or we'll look at it, the T-type. The T-type is still made of constantan, but on the other side, uh, it's made out of copper instead of iron, okay? And uh, so it'll typically have a red and blue instead of a red and white wire. And its temperature range is not nearly as high as quite, you know, not nearly a, as much of a temperature range as the J-type, although it does go a little bit lower, all right? So it'll go down to minus 450 instead of 350. Right. But uh, I'm not worried about you memorizing the copper and constantan um, and that kind of stuff. But I just wanted to show you some comparisons here. So, again, re remember here the key is remember J type is the most common. It's iron and constantan and uh, white and red wire. The rest of these, I'm just kind of showing you for comparison and just kind of make you aware. We already talked about the T-type. The E-type is is made out of chromel, which is a uh, registered alloy. And it's, um, you know, you can see the temperature range and, and different things here. So we have, you know, again, K-type, R-type, S-type, B-type. But you don't have to worry about what they're made out of or uh, those kind of things. But uh, just remember, like, if you need a thermocouple, you would want to research and find the thermocouple that sort of meets your, you know, meets your needs the best. So, um, you know, I've got some general comments over here of what they're uh, useful for, most useful for, and that kind of stuff. But... Um, one thing I want to point out here, this chart doesn't show up real well, but the fact is, is that these thermocouples are nonlinear. So you, you can see it in this blue one, I think, down here at the bottom, the best, it curves up. Okay, so the temperature, as the temperature goes up, the voltage goes up, but it's not in a nice linear fashion. Okay, so these are a nonlinear type of device. Uh, remember that also that they are passive. So how how do we work these? Well, um, technically what you would do is you would take your thermocouple. So over here is your tip of the thermocouple. And that's at the temperature that you want to measure. But what we need is we need a reference point. So effectively what we would do is we would take... Uh, and create an ice path bath where the where we connect our measurement wires to. So if this is an ice bath, then that means that you know technically it's uh, zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit if you want, um, right? Which is is an excellent reference point. So we actually kind of use this ice bath as our reference point to so that we can, when we measure the voltage, we know exactly what that is, okay? Now, the, um, fortunately though, we don't actually have to, you know, stick this in ice bath. Basically, we have electronic devices now that can um, mimic this and give us the temperature. Alright, so, uh, Anyhow, um, so we have these charts here. As you can see here is a chart which uh, shows for a J-type thermocouple. And it shows you for degrees. Now, this, this uh, is in degrees Celsius here, not degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this is a Celsius chart. But it shows you here, um, you know, if you were at like 5 degrees Celsius, um, with that zero degree reference junction, what that's saying here is that at, at five degrees Celsius, uh, 
we would be able to read 0 0.253 millivolts on that thermocouple. All right, and so this basically, these electronic devices that we, um, electronic uh, controllers and stuff that we can buy have effectively this table mapped inside them. So they, they electronically have this ice bath internally, okay, as an electronic circuit, and then they can measure the temperature from the thermocouple voltage and tell us what it is. So here is one of these devices I was talking about. This is a um, the Omega type thing, but it has settings so you can tell it, yeah, I've got a JTK, whatever type thermocouple you have. You can uh, connect it in there, you program it, tell it which thermal couple you have, and it effectively has this ice bath in there and this table in there, and it can actually just read out the temperature right to you. All right, and it can then send that temperature to your robot. You can also, in your uh, robots, right, robots are basically PLCs, and so you can you can buy a card to insert into the robot that is specifically designed to read the thermocouples. And so again, it, it has the electronics in there where it'll read the voltage from that thermocouple and be able to tell you the temperature uh, very accurately. All right, another type of temperature device is the RTD. So RTD stands for resistance temperature detector. And it's uh, just looking at it, a lot of times it looks very similar to a thermocouple because you're gonna have this uh, stainless steel uh, cover to protect it from corrosion and whatnot. But uh, the difference is the way that they work. So if we go back and just remind you here, the thermocouple takes two dissimilar pieces of metal that are joined together at one end and when you heat it, it just chases those electrons away on one and attracts the electrons in the other metal and gives you that voltage potential, kind of almost like a little battery in a way, but it's, you know, there's no real power there, but there's a potential difference that we can actually measure. RTDs, on the other hand, are resistance temperature detectors. What that means is that the resistance inside of this is going to change as the temperature increases or decreases. Okay, so um, these are active devices. To make these work, we're going to have to pump some current through them to measure that resistance. Okay, so the RTD is an active device, but the thermocouple is a passive device. Now, you can buy an RTD in two-wire, three-wire, or four-wire configurations. Honestly, I don't think I would mess with a two-wire because it's hard to tell the accuracy of them. So let's take a look here uh, at what happens. What you do is you have your RTD, you have this resistive device, and you connect it up, and you run a current through it, and you measure the voltage and you can tell what the resistance is, use it effectively Ohm's law, and that will tell you, um, tell you then, you know, what the temperature is. Now, the, because you'll know the resistance and you know that, uh, you know, you, it'll tell you effectively what the temperature is. Now the problem with this is that all wire has resistance. And so with the two wire connection here, when you connect this up, you, you're not 100% sure exactly how much resistance is in your wires. And then, and the problem is, I mean, you could determine how much resistance is in the wire, but the problem is, is when you heat the tip of the RTD, some of, at least some of the wire is also getting hot which means that the resistance in the wire is also changing. So the question becomes, how do we know 
you know, ba the actual resistance because we don't exactly know how hot the, the wire connecting to the RTD is and how much resistance was added in there. So that's where a three wire circuit and or a four wire uh, RTD come into play. So basically what we do is we have to have number one a very special power supply so we have to have a power supply that has uh, a voltage and a current uh, plus minus on it and we have to wire that up so you see here um, with the three wire configuration or four wire configuration on the bottom so we have to have a special power supply that we wire up to these and effectively what it does is we're going to run current remember there's current in or there's resistance in the wires so here's these are resistors indicating the resistance in the wires and this is the resistance in what they they're calling it the bulb the tip that tip covered with stainless steel that we're heating up that we want to measure the that we put near where we want to measure the temperature but the problem is, is we don't know this uh, resistance very well, especially once it starts heating up. And we don't know the resistance in the wires. So what we can do is we're going to run current through here, down through the bulb and back out and measure the current over here. Then we're uh, effectively we're going to run current through RL3 and measure it through RL2 and compare the two and subtract the two. So what we're saying here is that this resistance, all three of these resistances in these wires, the wires are effectively the same. They're all connected inside of the cable, so they're all effectively at the same temperature. And so when their resistance increases or decreases, they're increasing and decreasing the same. And so therefore what we can do is we can effectively subtract off these resistance values. So we basically measure all this resistance and then we measure this resistance and then we subtract the two which effectively gives us the bulb resistance which is the resistance we need to know to determine the temperature. All right, so a comparison here, if you want to measure uh, temperature, do you select a RTD or a thermocouple? Well, the RTD is an active device that needs a very special power supply to, uh, to work uh, effectively. Um, its max temperature is only maybe up to about 1,000 degrees. However, within its temperature range, it, it is a little bit more accurate and a little bit more repeatable than the thermocouple. So it's got a little bit better accuracy. Uh, the thermocouple is a passive device. It can measure higher temperatures. It actually costs less. They're usually more durable, and they usually react to temperature changes faster. So if a... Uh, um, you, if you want to be able to, to, to detect the temperature range, then you would want to uh, go the thermocouple way. All right, so load cells. Load cells are transducers that measure force. So uh, you may see these like an electronic scale you may have in your bathroom, but they come in all sizes. So we can measure like the weight for a truck. Um, a truck scale or for conveyors as material is moving down the conveyor uh, we can put load cells under there and we can measure as the material weight moves past we can measure the weight and determine how much material has actually moved past okay so uh, we we see these in a lot of different applications here they're used for uh, you're just making sure that trucks aren't overweight so they have these portable scales you can just actually have the truck drive right up on them all right now the way a load cell works is it uses a special 
electrical circuit called a Wheatstone bridge, which is four resistors wired together in what is usually drawn, at least, as a diamond shape. Okay, now the resistors don't actually have to be wired physically in the diamond shape, but this is the way they typically draw this. And this circuit is very, very sensitive to changes in resistance. So if we have these four resistors and we know three of the resistors to great precision and the other one resistor is going to change. And so uh, we can detect very slight changes in the resistance of that fourth resistor. All right, so typically uh, these um, load cells will have a resistance of about 350 ohms. But one of the resistors is a special type of resistor called a strain gauge. And so this is sort of what the strain gauge looks like. It's a thin strip uh, with uh, a little bit of copper in here. Uh, kind of weaved in and out. And this is bonded to the substrate of the metal of the load cell. And as tension is applied or pressure is applied to the load cell, it stretches the strain gauge and it changes the resistance within these, within these, Basically, this is just like a small copper wire or copper film. And as it's stretched apart or pushed together, the resistance in it actually changes. And so that's that fourth resistor. And even just a very slight change in pressure will result in a change in that resistance. And using this bridge circuit here, we can detect that very slight change of resistance, all right? So these guys are active devices. Load cells are active devices. They can detect both tension or compression, either one. And uh, they, they work very well, okay? You have to have four wires to them so that you have to apply, as I said, for these to work, you have to apply um, an external voltage to the like the top and bottom points of the bridge and then you're going to measure the voltage at the other two points and so if there's a slight change in this resistance we will be able to detect that and determine what the pressure is in this load cell what the forces are all right, now the range of load cells, um, they only output, again, a very small voltage, a maximum of about plus or minus 45 millivolts. Now, remember I say plus or minus because you can do either tension or compression. So with the same load cell. So if you, you know, if you're compressing it, uh, you'll get a, a positive voltage um, on your two sensor leads and then if you pull it and put tension in it then it'll the voltage will swing the other way all right so um lots of different load cells now we're starting to see these load cells being put in like grippers so here's an example of a, a gripper uh that actually has some load cells put in it so you can actually measure how 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 much force there is being applied to the item that you're picking up so if you can measure that force here's another example now that here's a video uh for this gripper and uh this gripper has a very uh, uh has kind of like an array on the load cell there so that um, it, it'll give it, a, it can measure pressure along this pad in different places. So you want to watch that video and uh, it'll show you that. I guess I can try to load it up here, but videos usually don't play too well here. <laughs> 
But uh, if you look at this load cell, okay, you see over here on the sensor, as he pushes it, it can actually detect where and how much force is being applied. Okay. So um, I'm not going to show you the whole video here, but you can uh, follow that link and, and watch that video. It's uh, very interesting. But uh, so this is a basically uh, a load cell sort of application here where we're detecting the force. So as we grab uh, an object, we can detect how much force is being applied on this gripper. All right, so the uh, load cell, as I said, um, is a very small voltage signal. It can only do uh, um, about a maximum of 45 millivolts. Okay, and millivolts don't transfer very well uh, across because as I talked about before, all wire has resistance. And so as you try to send this voltage signal across the wire, you get what's called attenuation. And so the further away the device is, the more resistance and therefore you lose that signal. All right. This attenuation problem can be solved by changing it from a voltage signal into a current signal. For current to work, you need a full, complete circuit, which means that the current is the same everywhere within the circuit. So we can use uh, converters and convert, let's say, a, a millivolt signal into a milliamp signal. So the most common milliamp signal we use is a four to 20 milliamp signal. And the beauty of these is the fact that they maintain that same current throughout the circuit, no matter the distance. Now that, you know, I mean, if your distance is too long, then that voltage might uh, drop and too much that the power supply can't compensate for it and so there is a maximum length but you you don't get the attenuation as long as it's within the uh, means of your converter you can send that 4 to 20 milliamp signal a long way to your robot controller or your PLC. Alright so analog signals um, analog signals, as we discussed before, um, the, well, the digital signal goes between zero and one, and that's all it is. But an analog signal now, it varies between two limits. Okay, so an analog signal is going to vary between two limits. So what those are, those limits are, there we have different choices. But uh, the with a transducer, it can output that signal anywhere within these limits. All right, so the uh, you know so the the signal can be any value here. All right, now the types of analog signals that we tend to see, now you could have others, but these are the most common. So you could have a voltage signal, zero to 10 volts, or you could go from minus 10 to plus 10 volts, or you could have millivolts, which is what we kind of saw with the uh, uh, load cells there, right? Millivolts is uh, load cells and also thermocouples out output just this very small millivolt signal. And then we can have our current signals, which uh, you could do zero to 20, but what you see most often is a four to 20 milliamp, okay? Um, for very large stuff, you may even see something like a zero to five ampere stuff, but that's not very common, all right? So the most common signals that we see is as either a zero to 10 voltage signal Sometimes zero to five, those are common in smaller electronic circuits. And then minus 10 to plus 10. Uh, and then for current signals, either zero to 20 or more commonly four to 20 milliamp signals.
All right, so just a, a kind of a review here about the voltage signals. Voltage signals are not good for long distances because they attenuate. All right, current signals are best for instrumentation, meaning uh, feeding signals into robots or PLCs because current signals do not have attenuation, number one. And number two, you can daisy chain this current signal into another PLC. So you, you could actually have one analog sensor and you could run it into the analog card of three different robots. And they would all be reading the exact same value from the exact same sensor. So you can daisy chain them together, okay? All right, so I talked about a converter here. These converters are maybe a couple hundred dollars, but they can read in these input voltages from a thermocouple or from a from a uh, load cell or from any kind of device, and then they can take this signal that that device is generating and output that into another type of signal. So most commonly either the zero to 10 or four to 20 milliamp signal. All right, so once it gets to the robot, right, it's an analog signal and it gets into the robot, but see robots are digital devices. And so we have to take that analog signal and convert it into a digital value which basically just becomes a number all right and so we do that through what's called an analog to digital converter on the other hand if we want to send an output out to say change the speed of a conveyor or something along those lines then we would use a digital to analog converter to send it back out Okay, so when we're going to convert the analog signal from our transducer into uh, a binary value into the controller of the robot. So um, when we do that, the analog to digital converter is going to have a resolution based on the number of bits. Um, that we can do it. So one one word is 16 bits. So that's 16 zeros and ones in a row. So 16 zeros and ones together is considered a word. So when that signal comes in, let's say that it's a 4 to 20 milliamp signal coming into the robot, that's going to be converted into a word. Now, um, that word consists of 16 bits. However, when we convert it, we don't always have a 16-bit converter. Okay, so the most... Um, Probably about the smallest converter that you would find now would be an 8-bit analog to digital converter. So that would mean it's only going to use 8 bits instead of 16. Uh, so a 255, or a 8-bit card or 8-bit converter means that you it's binary, so it can be a 0 or 1. So that's two possibilities. And so you take 2 to the 8th power, and 2 to the 8th power actually gives you 256, okay? And so, um, but the first value is zeros, and the max value then would be 8 ones. And so because you start counting from zero, a 2 to the 8th uh, gives you the maximum number is actually 255. So there's 250, two to the eight, 
2 to the 8th gives you 256 possibilities, but one possibility is all zeros. And so therefore, the 255 would be the highest number because you start counting from zero and you go up 256. So you're, you actually end up at 255. So your range is from zero to 255. If you have a 12-bit card, a 12-bit converter will give you 496 possibilities. But again, one of those is 12 zeros. And so that gives you your maximum value is 4095. So it's actually 2 to the 12th minus 1. Okay, or here it would be 2 to the 8th minus 1 gives you your maximum number. And this would be 2 to the 16th minus 1. So if you actually had a 16-bit converter, you would have 65,535 would be the highest number you could read. So um, now, obviously, if you're buying a analog to digital card, the 8-bit's the cheapest because it's the simplest to build. Um, and so it, it would give you the, you know, it would cost the least amount, but it also has the least resolution. All right. And as you go up in the bits in your converter, the more complex the converter gets, the better the resolution, but obviously the cost is also going to increase. All right, so uh, here's just an example. If I have an 8-bit converter and I'm reading a signal that is a, a 0 to 10 volt signal, so I'm, I've got um, my range of my analog signal is anywhere between 0 volts to 10 volts, then if I divide that by the 255 possibilities, okay, then we get the, uh, that's 39.2 millivolts per bit. Okay, so 39.2 millivolts per bit. That's the resolution I can detect. Now, if you remember, like for instance, a load cell, okay, the load cell outputs uh, millivolts. And so like the maximum that the load cell could put out would be 45 millivolts. So if we were to plug in that, uh, that load cell directly into the, this 8-bit analog to digital card, you would have to be at 39 millivolts before you would even detect a difference. All right, so obviously, number one, that's why we want to use uh, one of these converters, as we showed here, so that you could step up the 0 to 50 millivolt into a 0 to 10 volt range or into a current signal. All right, but the other thing to notice here is that as the voltage changes, here we can only detect a change in voltage of, of slightly more than 39 millivolts. So the voltage is going to have to change at least 39.2 millivolts before we detect that it changed at all. However, if we go for the more expensive 16-bit analog to digital converter, then our resolution is 152 microvolts. So that means that if your, your signal, if your analog signal changes by just 152 microvolts, then your number inside your analog to digital converter will change, which means that you can more easily detect that change. So you can detect a change of 0.152 millivolts or 0 0.000152 volts. All right, where over here you could only detect detect the change if it was 0392 volts, all right? So you can see here that you, you can detect a much smaller change if you go with a higher resolution analog to digital converter, all right? So you have a lot more detection of change. So you, you your 
if, if the analog signal, whether it was a load cell or a thermocouple or RTD, whatever it was, the higher number of bits in your analog to digital converter, then the more you can detect changes. So you can detect smaller changes. All right, so the typical uh, analog input for a FANUC robot is the module AAD04A, which is a 12-bit converter. So it can detect about 5 millivolt steps. So between 0 to 10 volts, and it'll detect a, or excuse me, from minus 10 to plus 10 volts, it can detect a 5 millivolt step with this 12 bit converter. So this is the, this these are the specs here for this uh, for this card for a Fanuc robot. So this is a four channel module meaning you could have pl this one module can have four different inputs, four different analog inputs into this one module and it'll convert those to uh, between 0 to 12 bits, which remember 12 bits, we talked about that over here, was uh, 4095. All right, and so that's going to give you effectively about uh, 5 millivolt steps in a minus 10 to plus 10 arrangement for the analog input. All right, so this is a rack for the, this rack would go inside of your controller of your FANUC robot. And if you look at it, it looks almost like a PLC rack. So these here are cards. Um, one of these cards could be an analog card, analog inputs, one could be analog outputs, one could be digital inputs, digital outputs, one could be for thermal couples. All right, so um, we can, buy various I.O. cards and attach here and uh, into this rack, all right? And then you could actually have multiple racks if you needed a lot of inputs, all right? So this is a rack. And so if we stick this in our FANUC robot, now number one, I do wanna say in, like in the classroom, we only have the LR Mate robots. The LR Mate robots, you can't add additional I.O. like this. This is only for the larger uh, class robots. But if you had one of those robots, you could insert this rack, and then in this rack you would put slot. There, it, there's these multiple slots. Each one of these cards here is another slot that you could plug in. And you see over here there's a couple of extra black connectors here in the back. That's where each one of these cards plug into. And then each card then is going to have like bits. If they're digital, at least if they're digital cards, they'll have bits. If they're analog cards, they'll have a channel and each channel would be 16 bits. So typically these cards would be like 16 bit cards. So if you're doing digital IO, you would have 16 bits for each card. All right, so an actual physical rack, as the one shown on the previous slide, starts numbering as rack one. And then if you need more, you could attach a second rack and a third rack and so on. However, we also have other types of analog or digital inputs we can connect that are network based. So one of those uh, that is available is a protocol that was created by Alan Bradley called DeviceNet. And so if you're using DeviceNet, then that would use racks 81 through 84. Now, one of the most common ones that we're seeing is something called Ethernet slash IP, where the IP means industrial protocol. And this uh, uses rack 89. So rack 89 is dedicated for Ethernet, IP, industrial protocol communications between robots and PLCs and sensors. There's a lot of what we call smart sensors now. 
which you actually just plug into the network and then they send their data to the robot across the network. And so they, they would most likely be using Ethernet IP. All right, there's some other uh, network communication protocols like Profibus, uh, which uses RAC 66 and 67. Um, the mate controller, as I said, the LR mate controllers like the robots that we have in the classroom. Uh, I don't know if you've been in the classroom yet, but it's room C205. You could stop by and see those robots. The, uh, these, these robots do not have the ability to add internal I.O. in the racks, as I said. But they, have, they do have some digital inputs and some digital outputs. Those digital inputs and outputs are in a special kind of embedded uh, into the controller. You can't add or remove any, but they have it in there. And those are assigned to rack 48. All right. So these ones in red here, you want to just kind of know that the physical racks like shown here, start numbering at rack one and the uh, ethernet ip uses rack 89 and the lrmh use rack 48 so these are the ones that uh, you definitely would want to know for the exam <clears throat> the fanic uh, robot actually supports several different types of io uh, they have the digital I.O., which, like I say, for the LR mate, it, it's built in. For the other FANUC robots, you would uh, plug a digital I.O. card into the I.O. rack. Um, they also have robot I.O. So on the, on the arm of the robot, there's built-in inputs and outputs on each robot. Now, when I say each robot, not every robot may have digital inputs or digital outputs built in, but they're, they're, they're definitely gonna have um, some outputs and uh, probably at least a couple of inputs. They may not give you access to all eight, although internally in the software, there's eight available, but depending on the particular robot that you purchased, it may not have external output, but on on the arm of the robot, they have inputs um, and outputs that will usually be available. There'll always be at least a few outputs available built into the arm of the robot. So those are referred to as robot inputs and outputs. Uh, then there is analog the analog inputs and outputs. Now the LR mates don't have internal analog inputs and outputs, but we can do it through Ethernet IP or some other um, network sort of communication. SOP is the standard operator panel. That's the, the buttons and switches on the controller of the robot itself. UOP would be a remote device such as a PLC or an HMI. Group I.O. is a special type of I.O. on a FANUC robot that is um, digital I.O. grouped together into a group of bits. So it's not separate I.O., but it's um, bits within the... Um, where, where we take digital inputs and outputs and group them together. All right, so that pretty much covers it for uh, analog and digital sensors. Again, this was a focus on analog sensors, and we talked about digital sensors last week.